like to call the meeting to order. Could you please take your seat? Two minutes. No, it's one minute. According to Janice. Would you like to or you're going to? I'd like to. And then, I, then I'm then i going to. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the meeting for the Western Riverside Council of Governments. Uh, Executive Committee, at this time, please Log in that you're present. <laughs> Janice, do we have a quorum? Yeah, we do. Okay. Just checking. Are we good? Yes, ma'am, we're good. We have quorum. I'm just having an issue with the items showing on the screen. All right, we have 17 here. Okay, we'll go on to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance given by Lily Rogers from City of Paris. to item three, public comments. Janice, I understand we have Dr. Cameron Kaiser, health officer for Riverside County, is here to provide information on the coronavirus. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Dr. Cameron Kaiser and I'm the public health officer for the county. Um, before we get into our county update, let me give the committee a status update on the current worldwide and state outlook uh, as far as our statistics. Total cases worldwide, there are approximately 90,130 as of this morning, 80,026 of them are in mainland China, and 67,103 are in Hubei province, including in the city of Wuhan, which is the center of the epidemic. Uh, there are 4,335 cases in South Korea, 1,694 in Italy, and 978 in Iran, which are the three most affected countries outside of China. In the United States, we have a total of 91 cases as of this morning in 10 states. Uh, 65 of them are travel associated, 26 of them appear to be community spread in origin, which I'll talk about briefly in a moment. 
Worldwide, uh, 3,083 uh, 3, deaths have been recorded. 2,803 of those were in Hubei province. There are six deaths in the United States. Uh, four of those were reported today. Uh, we do not have confirmation, but they appear to be linked uh, to the nursing home outbreak in Washington state. In California, we have 37 cases. However, those cases are not evenly distributed. In Southern California, we have a grand total of four. Uh, we have one and only case in Riverside County, but that individual actually is not in Riverside County. They are in a Northern California hospital. They are convalescing well, and they will be negative before they return. Uh, approximately 8,700 returning travelers are being monitored statewide. The vast majority of these individuals have turned out to be asymptomatic and have passed their 14-day quarantine without incident. Uh, we have 53 of them in Riverside County. That, name, that number changes from day to day. Um, there are currently no recognized treatments, and while vaccine research is ongoing, the earliest estimates for availability are approximately one year away at this time. So currently we continue to be in a containment mode. Um, we have no community transmission in Riverside County based on repeatedly negative test results. All the individuals that we have tested have come up negative, um, and all the individuals we've monitored, as I mentioned, have passed through their 14-day mandatory quarantine without incident. However, you should be aware that due to increasing test availability, both state and nationwide, that we expect those case counts throughout the country to increase. Uh, we currently do have testing available through the state. We are working on getting our local public health lab up and running as well. We have a couple of hoops to jump through with the state, but all of our paperwork is in, and we hope to be able to get some urgent tests through other health departments as necessary. Uh, the department today is also opening our Medical Health Department Operations Center to act as a joint information resource and to make sure that we can facilitate planning for the other efforts which are going forward. Obviously, our priorities include our schools, medical facilities, and the general public to make sure that everyone knows what to expect and appropriate actions that should be taken. As we have no local cases currently and no documented spread, I have not advised to the Board of Supervisors that we make an emergency declaration. However, I would, not be he I would not hesitate to do so if we did get a case in order to facilitate us finding additional exposures uh, in a prompt method so that we can find them as quickly as possible. Obviously, even though there are far more flu cases in the county, of course, uh, COVID-19 may be up to twice as communicable as the flu. And while certain age ranges seem to be less affected, we are obviously greatly concerned about those people who are medically vulnerable or elderly who may be at unique risk of the complications of the illness, and we want to find and identify those people at risk promptly. Uh, we continue to observe the local and national landscape and uh, make sure that our responses are appropriate and thorough. And of course, we would not hesitate to keep you, uh, as well as our Board of Supervisors and the public, informed about the situation as it stands. Um, that concludes the, my initial remarks, uh, of course, available for questions. <clears throat> any committee members have any questions for Dr. Kaiser? Seeing none, we appreciate you coming and giving us an update. Thank you very much. Moving on to item four, the minutes for the February 3rd meeting. Does anyone have any comments or corrections or discussion on any of those, uh, any of the minute items? Hearing none, Janice, would you please set the system up for a vote? Oh, oh yeah. Um, you'll see on your front folders, you have a visual <laughs> of what you're supposed to press. <laughs> When, just to, when you're to watch the video. So pay attention to that so that we're... Which hand? Yeah, which hand? <laughs> we have a second, or we have a first by San Jacinto and a second by Banning. Waiting for Eastvale. And it looks like that was approved 19 by 19-0. Thank you. Next item is item five, the consent calendar consists of items 5A through 5J. They may be re, um, enacted in one motion. Does anyone wish to pull an item for discussion? Seeing none, Janice, would you set the system up? Waiting for Elsinore, waiting for EMWD. Yeah, I can. <laughs> and that's approved by 19. Thank you. <laughs> Next item. Item six, reports. Report by Aaron Sassi on with the League of California Cities. Uh, 
Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. Aaron Sassy with the League of California Cities. I believe you all have a pretty extensive written report for me, so I will say please read it. There's a lot of good information, but I do just want to highlight a couple additional items for you. There is a new bill introduced this year that will be introduced that is a repeat of a bill last year. It was AB 1184. That basically would require all of your cities to retain emails for a two-year period. Um, there's a meeting on this tomorrow. We're not sure if they've made any amendments. Um, we'll find out at that meeting tomorrow, but the governor did veto it last year. Depending on how that meeting goes, we'll uh, likely have an opposition letter ready to go and then sample letters for all of you. So uh, watch for that. Um, there is also another bill that we're looking for some feedback on. Basically, there may be some funding available for all of you to implement the SB 1383 requirements. The um, organic waste diversion program. Um, so what I could use from you is if you could go back to your cities and say how much money would we need for implementing this and then let me know those figures, it would really help us um, gauge if this bill will even be helpful or not. But I guess at some point any money is better than no money. Um, also, just AB5, I know that there's a lot of controversy with that. It's been in the news, but if you haven't already looked at your contracts in light of AB5, I definitely want to recommend that you do so. We've heard some mixed feedback that some cities are finding that they do feel that some of their contracts could fall within AB5. Some people haven't really seen that, but look at like your landscaping, trash, just whatever your contracts are, please work with your city attorneys on that. Um, <clears throat> lastly, you should be getting from me this week um, some information on our board action. The governor did come to our last board meeting. They talked a lot about housing, homelessness. They did a press conference afterwards, basically kicking off that second leg of his homelessness tour. But at that board meeting, our board did adopt some policies on housing. So I'll have more on that, but basically we're taking a three-year or three-pronged approach. There'll be some short-term solutions, some longer-term solutions, and then which includes funding, and then also uh, what's outside of our scope. So what would be outside of our scope is like the requirements for solar, solar panels being on houses. Obviously we don't control that, but it drives up the costs. Um, some of the short-term we have right now ACA 1 that's moving through the legislature, and then SB 795, this is the new redevelopment bill of this year. So that is some funding <clears throat> uh, mechanisms that we would definitely support. Um, part of the governor's proposal is also that he's, list, he's released a list of state properties that could be used to house homelessness. Um, a lot of the properties in our area were like the fair properties, but if there's something that's within your jurisdictions that isn't on the list, they're open to hearing if you're interested in, in doing a lease for that. So if you have a property, <laughs> let me know um, what it may be, because like I said, they're willing to work with all of you on that. Um, but more to come on housing this week. Hopefully, as soon as I get that information, I'll be sending it out to you. Our next division meeting is this coming Monday. The city of Indio is hosting us. Um, we're having Supervisor Perez's office come and talk about the governor's homelessness task force recommendations. I think there'll be some opportunity if you have any sort of feedback um, to provide it in a very quick and precise manner. Um, but then the fun part of the meeting is that we're doing golf cart polo. So dress casually for this meeting. It will be outside. <laughs> Uh, but thank you for having me. Ledge Action Day is coming up um, in April. I'm starting to work on our legislative meetings, but if you're planning to come to that, I know registration is, is open. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, does the committee have any questions for Aaron? We're Hearing coming. none. Saying that? We're good. Can I make one oh, sure. Yeah, just one comment, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Aaron mentioned SB 1383. That's a mandatory organics recycling bill. Uh, WRCOG does have a solid waste committee that meets periodically, so we'd be happy to work uh, through your staff on that committee uh, so we can get an indication of what kind of resources they think they need in order to implement the provisions of that bill. That'd be great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'll work with you too. That's okay. good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next item, 6B, presentation by Ann Mayer, uh, Executive Director for RCTC on the proposed traffic relief plan. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I very much appreciate the opportunity to join you here today to present on RCTC's draft traffic relief plan that is currently out for uh, review by the public as well as for um, review by you as elected officials. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm joined in the audience by RCTC Deputy Executive Director John Standiford as well as External Affairs Director Aaron Haight. So they are here with me as well. So you might ask why is RCTC embarking on a draft traffic relief plan? And besides the obvious answers of it's the responsibility of the commission to plan both for the short term and long term transportation needs of this county, it's also because we're at a very critical point in this county with the increasing population in the county, the projections for what not only a population growth, but also the need for additional housing here in Riverside County, we've got to have a frank conversation about where we are from an infrastructure standpoint. Now, certainly infrastructure is a challenge across the board, no matter what kind of infrastructure we're talking about, but from a transportation perspective, there is no doubt that increasing congestion is really impacting the quality of life for many of your constituents, for many of the residents here. It's not only a quality of life issue when someone is on the road for a couple of hours in uh, one way. I'm looking at uh, Council Member uh, uh, Scott here, uh, his city is very uh, familiar with those travels as well as many of uh, you other, uh, your other jurisdictions are as well. People are on the road for way too long and it's making a real uh, impact on quality of life. So our commission has directed us to look at a traffic relief plan that looks at a, several different areas. A first off is connecting our communities. For Riverside County to thrive both economically and from a quality of life standpoint, our communities need to be connected. We need to reduce traffic congestion. Traffic congestion is a significant problem, as well as the need to improve safety. With the population expansion, the uh, limited capacity we have on many of our roadways, public safety is becoming an increasing concern, not only from a motor vehicle standpoint, but for pedestrians and bicyclists as well. Another key component for our board has been about the need to bring more jobs to Riverside County and to bring more jobs home. Many of the reasons why people hit the road every morning to travel to work is because their jobs are in San Diego, Orange Counties, and Los Angeles. If, a folk, if there's a focus on bringing more jobs home, we cut down not only on the number of people on the road every day, but also make sure that we're contributing to a thriving Riverside County economy. Another reason we're looking at the plan is uh, just to be able to focus on being able to have local governance over local priorities with a local funding source. Now, 30 or 40 years ago when the first, actually in 1988, when the first Measure A was passed, at that time about 90% of all transportation funding was coming from state and federal sources and the measure was supposed to supplement that. That's not the case anymore at either the state or the federal level. Most of the funding is coming from the local level. We did an analysis of the RCTC budget from 1997 until this past year, and this is an average of all of the expenditures. 81% of transportation funding is coming from a local source, 81%. And that is not going to change. We are at a point where state and federal funding is not going to be the solution to our ability to implement an important transportation network. Wow. Now, we've been very fortunate. Voters have twice approved a sales tax measure here in Riverside County. It's an important resource. It's allowed us to be able to leverage those precious state and federal dollars and turn them into something bigger. So Measure A is important. The top box here shows you the uh, money available that we will have for the highway and road component in Measure A between now and 2039. It's about $1.2 billion. That's a lot of money. But when you start stacking that up against the needs that we have throughout the county, you can see that it's simply not enough. Looking at that bottom row, you've got real, we've got some really key projects, Mid-County Parkway, State Route 79 realignment. Those two projects have environmental documents completed, we've gone through the legal challenges, we've won the legal challenges and those projects are ready to move forward and those are just two very important projects within the corridor. So you can see, even though we have local resources, it's simply not enough. 
In 2019, the Commission was required to do a 10-year assessment of where we are with measure projects. Uh, we did that. We also approved a 10-year delivery plan 2019 through 2029. You can see here in blue there's some projects highlighted that will be funded in the next 10 years based on the available revenues. And if you're looking at your jurisdiction, most of you are seeing that you don't have a key corridor in your jurisdiction with investment coming from Measure A. And if that's what you see, you're absolutely right because we simply don't have enough money to go around. The draft traffic relief plan that we've currently developed not only has additional improvements along many of the freeway corridors, but we've got improvements in all modes, not just roads, it's in roads, transit, bicycle and pedestrian facilities, as well as others. So um, if you look at what's available in current funding, we're pretty limited in the projects that we would be able to implement. In the draft traffic relief plan that's out on the street right now, this, uh, we've got investments by different type. I've mentioned that we are focusing on a full multimodal approach. We've got 19% allocated to better roads, and that's exactly what it, uh, what it says is what it means. Better roads means your local roads, whether it be related to uh, investing in bicycle and sidewalk facilities, widening your local roads, uh, local maintenance of some of those roads, but uh, it's also an important category for improving safety. We have many two and four lane roads throughout the county where safety is becoming an, of increasing concern. So this category would invest in safety of the local road system. Easier highway access is interchanges. Many, if not most of your jurisdictions are along at least one, if not two interstates or state routes. Access to the highway system is really important, not only access to the freeway, but also the ability for your residents to get home at night. Um, and, and also if we start talking about bringing jobs home, we need to be able to have access so businesses are able to thrive by having their customers come to their businesses. And uh, certainly not the uh, least importance is the, um, is the need to have good public safety access. And we've got medical facilities, hospital facilities, where access is limited because of a lack of interchanges. Faster highways means that we have corridors that need to be moving people quicker and we need to move more people through. More train service at 20% is an important investment, not only in additional rail capacity, and by that I mean additional track, but it's also about investing in, in additional operations so we have more trains running between Riverside County and Orange and Los Angeles, as well as uh, more frequent trains, but also reverse commute trains so that we can bring residents of LA and Orange County to work here in Riverside County. Uh, the lack of that reverse commute service has been something we've been hearing from business and community leaders for a number of years, that in order for train service to work for them, they've gotta be able to get their employees here at the start of a workday. Frequent bus service is about extension of additional uh, commuter bus service, but also an important component, two important components in this category is the investment in zero emission fleets. All of our transit operators in this county as well as across the state are required to have zero emission vehicles. That is a huge investment and this traffic relief plan would provide the funding for all of our transit agencies to not only convert their fleet, but also to be able to invest in the maintenance facilities that they would need to maintain the, the new fleet. Also in this category is providing support for seniors, disabled, and veterans. Longer trails is the backbone system for the trail system in Western Riverside County. Help with my commute is freeway service patrol. And then we also have new technology in that there are advances in technology that we, uh, we may not know what they, uh, they might be today, but certainly as technology advances over the next several years, we need to be able to invest in new technology that will help us move more people through. I've highlighted some of the categories and some of the projects, so I won't belabor those, but these are some of the projects that are included in the, uh, in the tra draft traffic relief plan. In addition to local road widening, we also have grade separations as well as uh, other improvements. I mentioned before that we have additional transit access and access for seniors, youth, and uh, low-income individuals. 
So part of the question here is about what will an additional sales tax measure mean for the, uh, the county of Riverside. And, and if we're looking at a half cent sales tax measure over a 30 year period and we had to pick a, a term for it in order to be able to estimate it, we project that that will mean that about $7.7 .7 billion will be invested in the design, engineering, and construction of projects and programs. That translates into approximately 59,000, 60,000 direct and secondary jobs, not only for the industry, but the really important factor here is that with wages coming in at about $3.5 billion, the more people who are working, the more people who are spending money buying a car, going out to dinner, investing in a new home, investing in furniture. So the indirect impacts of these kinds of investments are important as well. This slide highlights some of the key sectors and as, as you might expect, uh, many of the direct jobs would come uh, directly towards uh, those in the construction and engineering, but also in uh, machinery rentals, asphalt manufacturing. So there is a trickle down effect throughout the construction industry as well. So the draft traffic relief plan is out for public review. It was released in January and it is available at trafficreliefplan.org. If you go to that website, you can not only see the plan, there's some interactive um, tabs there as well where you can take a look at what it, uh, the detailed list on projects within your area. And you can also take a survey. Since we posted this in the middle of January, we've had over 2,500 surveys completed and we've had over 5,000 comments submitted on the plan. And this is exactly what the intent was with putting this plan out on the street, was making sure that the residents of Riverside County had the opportunity to weigh in on this plan and to voice their opinion about whether the plan, were we focused on the right things, are there projects missing, are we investing too much money in one category or another. The commission is accepting feedback on the plan until June 10th. On June 10th at the commission meeting, the commission will not only consider approving the traffic relief plan, but they will also consider whether or not to put this on the ballot for November 2020 for consideration by the voters. I think it's important to point out whether or not the commission decides to put this on the ballot for voters, this is still a traffic relief plan that will set the stage for investments in this county for the next couple of decades. The plan is important. The plan sets our priorities, and the goal of the plan is that it reflects the communities uh, that we serve. So with that, I'll close my presentation and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ann. Does, does any of the community members have any questions for Ann at this time? I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Go ahead. So, so Ann, on the funding, you know, you were talking about how state funding is and federal funding is becoming less and less. Mm -hmm. How are other counties and regions doing? Their, how are they faring in that as well? Because, you know, one of the things that bothers me is the more we put in, it seems the less we benefit. In other words, everybody sees us, oh, they can take care of themselves. And so we keep being trying to be dependent. And, you know, at some point, I think we wind up asking the public to fully fund themselves and we're still paying taxes to fund all the other stuff and we're just not getting our, our money back from the state and federal government that we need to be able to do these projects. And then the second thing is our projects cost three times as much as they cost anywhere else and so we don't get the bang for our buck. <laughs> and, and somewhere somebody, I, I don't know where the RCTC can point that out that you know, we need to have some. Hello. No. <laughs> we need to have a conversation about the things that cost us so much, the lawsuits and the things like that, and and trying to to make it make these projects immune from that, so that we can get them in, because they're of dire consequence for people's quality of life and there are dire consequence for the environment and all these things, but all of those, those out external forces are just causing us to have to spend so much money and we're just not getting the amount of project we should get for the amount of money that we're trying to commit. And that's what's, I think, scaring everybody up. I love the plan 
I think everybody is like, I want the plan. It's just when it comes to funding, it's, it's hard for people to get their arms around and, and, and feel like we're just doing ourselves a disservice because we're showing them that we'll try and do it ourselves and we're not getting the help we need. Okay, thank you very much for the, the comments and questions. So first I'll talk about the fair share. Uh, from a, a statewide perspective, generally we would anticipate that about, in any competitive program at the statewide level that we would want to see at least 6% come back to Riverside County based on our population and the lane miles that we have of roads. We historically meet or exceed that 6%. Some programs we do even better. I'll give you an example. Active transportation program, I think we have been averaging about 12% statewide. So there are some of the statewide programs where we're getting at least our fair share. The problem is there just isn't enough money to go around. At the federal level, again, we're getting our fair share of formula dollars, but the federal government doesn't have any um, probably there's no motivation to increase the amount of money coming out. So at the state and federal level, we get our fair share. And I'll, I'll use an example. We were very, very fortunate, you know, certainly due to the hard work of many people in this room and others, to, uh, for Temecula to receive $50 million in federal funding. Uh, Congressman Kelvert did an outstanding job there. Was that the only project in California that got federal funding? I mean, that, that, that is a huge accomplishment. So from a fair share standpoint of what's available, we get our fair share. Now, if you talk about how everyone else is doing, there are 25 other self-help counties in the state of California. Most of them, most of us, have at least two sales tax measures. Several of them are going out this year for additional sales tax measures. We're all in the same boat. There isn't enough money available at the state and federal level to fund all of our needs. So it's either local funding or no funding. So that's the, the box that everyone's in at this point. I would also say that, you know, there's been lots of conversations of, well, if we just if we don't do anything, will it force investment? Maybe, maybe not. So it's, we call it the the wagon on the or the wheel on the wagon <laughs> theory. Is if the wagon is going down the hill at high speed and the wheel is coming off, do we try and hold the wheel on and keep it going, or do we let the wheel fall off and see what happens? And that's that is a that's an analogy that's used across the state is that how do we keep moving projects forward? And this is becoming one of the only ways to do so. With respect to projects costing too much, projects cost a great deal of money at this point. It wasn't that long ago, um, probably 17 years ago, where a $300 million project was probably the most expensive project we thought we'd see, and now that is an average or lower than average cost of a big project. So project costs are very high, but what I would say most of the money is in the construction. And the conversations about delay on projects, lawsuits on projects, California Environmental Quality Act, law, the law could go away on the environmental side, so we'd spend zero money on environmental clearance and zero money on lawsuits. It's a very small percentage of these project costs. We still need to be able to fund construction. So yes, projects cost a lot. We need to, we need to make sure that we minimize cost as much as possible. But I think we're at a point in time where projects are very, very expensive to complete. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the committee? Lenafee? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Kelly, you brought up a couple of my questions already. Um, and I wanted to ask, you know, um, with respect to the cost of the projects, why are they growing so much? You said construction costs, but I'm hearing it's, you know, some of the standards that Caltrans is forcing you to use and things like that that's causing these projects to become unattainable. Well, certainly, certainly having to build a project to freeway standards means it costs more. Uh, it's the standards are higher. 
uh, for example, concrete pavement instead of asphalt pavement. They're built for higher speeds. So yes, if it's on the state highway system, it's likely going to cost more because it has to be able to have higher volumes of traffic, higher speeds. But costs are increasing on local projects as well. Whether, even if you take Caltrans out of the picture, if we're just talking about local roads, local roads are costing a great deal of money too. And so I think a lot of this is just from a, a cost escalation standpoint in terms of the cost of labor, the cost of equipment, the cost of material, and it's similar to any kind of construction where things just cost a great deal of money. And one of the, the focus areas for RCTC is how can we deliver projects faster more effectively and at lower cost. So we've used, for example, design build on a couple of really big projects that we think saves a lot of time. And for us, time is money. The faster we can get projects built, the lower the cost is not only to build them, but also for the traveling public. So I don't, I don't think it's any one answer on costs, but it's not as, it's not as straightforward as just if Caltrans relaxed their standards, projects would cost less. There's a lot of other factors there. So, so an example is, for example, Scott Road Interchange in Menifee um, mm -hmm. a while back that that bridge and interchange um, had asphalt on and off ramps. When the city of Menifee decided to try and take it on, they, Caltrans came back and said, no, no, our standards have changed. We now have a 50 year shelf life or whatever the number is, mm -hmm. and we want PCCP. So we want a, a significantly larger structural section on the, on the bridge mm -hmm. than we did before. And we go, wait a second, this was good. Yeah. Five years ago, you know, who, who's telling us that this now needs to be this standard? You know, in, in, in my opinion, in my experience has been, um, you know, Caltrans is trying to absolve themselves of any responsibility for ongoing maintenance. So the question goes back to Kelly's question, where's the money going? If they're not doing the maintenance because they're getting more money for the, you know, out of these projects, how does this pencil out? Okay, that, that's a great example. Thank, thank you for bringing that one up because that is now a requirement. Most interchanges, now the ramps are made out of, are, are built out of concrete. The reason for that is that asphalt, especially with truck, heavy truck traffic, asphalt starts getting ruts in it, it starts breaking down sooner. So not only Caltrans, but also RCTC on our projects, we're looking at ways of not just reducing the initial construction cost, but its whole life cycle cost. That if we can get in and get out, build it once and not have to come back, we won't have to pay the higher cost to rehabilitate all of those ramps, but more importantly, we don't have to disrupt the thousands of people using that ramp every day to rebuild and repave it. So you'll see more of a conversation in, in the, you know, the transportation industry about what's the overall life cycle cost of the project and how do we decrease that? Not, not just the short term, can we save money, but over a 20 year life or a 30 year life, what's the lowest cost possible? And, and really uh, on, for a, a lot of what we do, Traffic staging and traffic handling and making sure people can still move through the projects is probably one of the most significant factors now in, in making project decisions. For the most part, we have to, this is like a, I, this is an exaggeration, like a doctor performing operation, an operation on a patient who's awake. <laughs> When we build projects on most roads, we pretty much have to do it without any lane closures. Or if we do have lane closures, they're at night or there's minimal impact because the cost to the communities and the traveling public is so high, we have to try to build it while under live traffic and that increases costs sub substantially. So yeah, that's why they would make that switch and it's one I would support in that from a taxpayer standpoint, if we can build a project the right way the first time that makes the most sense for a couple of decades and that means taxpayers money, even if it's a different color of money, can be spent somewhere else. Okay, and then my last question, mm -hmm. um, coming from a city that recently uh, floated a sales tax measure and was successful, um, we did some polling with our residents and one of the things that they asked for was an oversight committee. Mm -hmm. um, is there any, are you proposing any sort of oversight committee aside from the RCDC board or what are you looking at? 
that is still a conversation that's taking place with the board. We have a we have a traffic relief strategy committee that's meeting to provide us with policy guidance. So as we're getting feedback from folks, and I'll take that as feedback, that uh, that's one of the options that they're considering is, is having an, an oversight committee in place. So that is one of the options being considered. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Ann. Oh, I see we have Beaumont. Uh, real quick, to, we're all talking about getting the most bang for our buck. These jobs, uh, when they're bid, are they all bid at prevailing wage? And if so, is there any way of getting away from that? Because that increases the cost quite substantially. No. <laughs> it prevail. It, <laughs> I don't know any other way to answer it. Prevailing prevailing wages. Prevailing wages are required on any project that has any state or federal nexus. So I do not see any project that we would ever put forward not have prevailing wages in it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know it was worth an ask though, huh? A <laughs> wish. Well, thank you very much, Ann. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, next item, item 6C, presentation by Karthik Ramakan. Oh, Ramakrishnan, Professor of Public Policy and Political Science at UCR on the 2020 Census. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is just a brief update on what's happening on Census, but also given that Census is almost upon us, to um, remind everyone on some of the key points about why this is so important uh, for our jurisdictions and our communities. So I am uh, I'm a professor at UC Riverside. Uh, I also direct the Center for Social Innovation, which is one of the key partners for the Inland Empire Complete Count Committee. Uh, I'm also the director of the IE Complete Count Committee. This is an unpaid position. Uh, the Complete Count Committee uh, is chaired by Supervisor Perez from Riverside County, as well as Supervisor Rutherford from San Bernardino County. Just to highlight some key facts, I, I, I'm, I'm, I know that many of you know these already, but just as a refresher, especially when it comes up in conversations uh, with, um, with, with uh, uh, officials in your agencies as well as with community members. First of all, what is the census? It is important to note that this is a count of all persons. This is the only count that occurs. There are surveys that occur uh, between every 10 years, but we only have one shot every 10 years to do a population count. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. It's important for representation, allocation of public dollars, all of the kind of planning decisions that we make um, uh, here in this region and elsewhere depend vitally on having accurate data. And then for businesses too, uh, the census serves as a gold standard for marketing data, and I'll say more about that in a minute. One thing many of you might benefit from is to have a look at the census form, right? So when people talk about some of the anxieties that constituents might face when they are asked to fill out a census form, it actually asks for a fair amount of uh, information that might be considered uh, you know, personal or sensitive information. So it asks about the number of people uh, in the dwelling. It asks about the relationship between people in the dwelling. It asks whether it's owned or rented or occupied without payment of rent. It also asks for a telephone number for follow-up. It also asks for the person's name, their sex, and their date of birth. And then it asks about their race or ethnic origin. The reason why it asks for information like date of birth is that it is important to deduplicate records. So the census is not only a count of all persons, they want to make sure that everyone is counted once, only once, and in one location. And so say someone is staying in a dorm room and they're counted at UCR, but their parents also fill out that same information for that individual in their home address. The Census Bureau needs a way to be able to deduplicate that, which is why they require all of this information. Now with all of this information, and especially information about potential overcrowding, there's a lot of anxiety that this kind of information might be used against people. And so this is why over the course of nearly a year, we've had a partnership with nonprofits, county governments, and other governments to reassure residents. And this is why nonprofits have been some of the most effective messengers 
Um, often people don't trust government when government says, trust us. We're not going to use this information against you. So that's been the work uh, over the past year, and it's uh, increasing uh, in, its, in, its, um, uh, in its frequency and in its urgency. I presented this before. The heart-to-count uh, population is very high in our region, and especially in more uh, rural areas, but even in urban areas. This is, uh, if you go to the state of California's complete count effort and you look at the heart-to-count map, you can drill down at a very local level and you'll see a lot of red, and a lot of red is not good. These are areas with high heart-to-count uh, populations. The undercount risk, now this is admittedly a very high measure. Uh, we are absolutely uh, not going to have one million undercounted in our region. But we have one million living in census tracts with high hard to count scores. And so we've been doing a tremendous amount of work in the last year so that people, residents in these hard to count areas are being contacted in person uh, with various nonprofit partners, but they're also getting messages through their faith-based leaders, as well as through various government agencies that they're coming into contact with, um, including uh, entities like First Five uh, and others that serve our populations. Why does the undercount matter? So every person that's undercounted, um, the federal government estimates that it's a $2,000 loss per year per person in public dollars. Right? So for every 1,000 people undercounted in Riverside County, that's $2 million a year. Project that over 10 years, that's $20 million. This adds up very quickly. So it's, uh, it's, it's both heartening and also not surprising to see why all of us realize how serious this is and why it's important for everyone to count. The 1990 undercount in California meant a $2.2 billion loss for California annually. Hmm. It also means, an undercount also means the loss of representation. So not only might California lose a seat in the House of Representatives, we know based on survey data, the American Community Survey, is that we've gained population vis-a-vis -vis LA County. But that is not gonna translate into representation in the State Assembly or the State Senate unless we have an accurate count. And then finally, if we don't have an accurate count, it means that we have bad consumer data. So I'm a political scientist, I'm also a demographer. We've been working with the Census Bureau at the national level on some of their race and ethnicity measures uh, in the past decade. The American Community Survey is relied on heavily by businesses as well as agencies for planning purposes. The way to think about that is it's kind of like, um, not, I don't know how many people do photocopies anymore, but you have the original, then you have copies. Right now, when we're talking about the 2018 and the 2019 ACS, those are multiple copies of the original. So the quality degrades over time. When you look at the American Community Survey, for example, if you look at the 2010, uh, the 2010 American Community Survey and the 2010 census, you have a big jump in the population because the 2010 American Community Survey was based on the 2000 census. The 2019 and the 2020 ACS is based on the 2010 census. It is so important for us to get that gold standard right, that original right in the 2020 census, because that's going to affect data for the next 10 years. So how are we organizing and innovating when it comes to achieving a complete count? Um, this is something I've presented before. We have the complete count committee that unites um, government agencies, uh, as well as nonprofits, as well as the business sector in a united effort. The objectives are to share information across sectors, to collaborate, to avoid duplication, but also being aware of gaps that exist. Um, also to make sure that resources are allocated efficiently as well as equitably. One of the things I'm very proud about is how we have different regions carved up for the Inland Empire so that regions traditionally that have not gotten as much attention, like Southwest Riverside, like the Coachella Valley, like the High Desert, have representation and resources allocated according to their need. So that's the way this effort has been organized. And we think that this is a very solid foundation to potentially think about future work that we can do together, not only across sectors, but also making sure that all regions count uh, in the work that we do. And I'm happy to talk a little bit more in the Q&A about some, what some of the future um, things we can anticipate as post-census work. 
We're already getting a lot of coverage when it comes to earned media coverage. On top of that, if you haven't seen them already, you'll start to see more and more paid advertisements um, on TV while you're watching your YouTube videos and the like. In fact, uh, on, during the Super Bowl, um, Riverside County had an ad in Coachella Valley. It was brilliant. They they found out that it was not that expensive to do if you focused on a particular geographic area. And so there was an ad featuring local heroes and sheroes from the Coachella Valley. It ended with Supervisor Perez like tossing a football that talked about the complete count effort. Similarly, San Bernardino County had an ad that was done in Spanish during the Super Bowl that was aired in Fox Deportes, which is the Spanish language Fox Sports. It's really amazing to think of the creativity of our, of our county staff in terms of identifying opportunities like these to, um, to get the word out. Where we are in terms of timeline, uh, we've been planning for over a year in terms of data, in terms of mapping, forming the committees. Education has also been ongoing and it continues, including in forums like these. We are now getting into the motivation stage, um, pledge cards, door-to-door -door contact, trusted messengers, and then activating. So we have an election tomorrow. Many of you have heard of Get Out the Vote. Right after Get Out the Vote, the only thing we should be thinking about for the next couple of months is to get out the count. And that's going to start on March 12th, which is when the postcards start getting mailed out from the US Census Bureau. For the first time, the census is going to be digital first. We, they want to try to get as many people to fill it out online as possible because it reduces the cost of follow-up. I was going to ask that question. And especially in, an, in, an, in a time in which there's a lot of concern about coronavirus, like we want as many people filling it out online as possible. The federal government is prepared. They're, well, knock on wood, we're not going to have another disaster like the Affordable Care Act enrollment where computer servers crashed. Um, they have multiple points of backup, uh, have been in presentations in which they assure us that cybersecurity is going to be at the highest level. Um, so um, hopefully that will all remain true, because uh, there will be millions of people that are hitting those servers every day. Census Day is April 1st, uh, so it is also April Fool's Day, but it's, the, it's a day in which it will mark um, the count. In fact, when you look at the census form, it asks where that individual is located on April 1st. So even if you didn't fill it out on April 1st, you need to know where that individual needs to be placed on that date. There are important resource uh, implications, right, in terms of where people are located. And then finally, the non-response period is from May through July, and this is that expensive follow-up, right, in terms of postcard reminders, phone calls, and then ultimately going door to door uh, to try and enumerate the population. Finally, have an update from Riverside County uh, from Jason Farron, who's helping to coordinate the efforts for Riverside County. Uh, so the county, first of all, is sharing uh, state funding for census outreach with cities. And so those allocations have been doled out based on the percentage hard to count of the total represented in each city. Uh, the county is also contracting with the Inland Empire Community Foundation as well as the Riverside County Office on Education on Outreach. And I've heard some interesting and inspiring examples of working with high school teachers to make sure that they are getting the word out uh, among their students and their communities. Advertising, so billboards, banners, radio ads, television ads, newspapers, and events, including the Date Festival, for example. There was a presence there in terms of spreading awareness. You might start hearing about quacks. These are questionnaire assistance centers and questionnaire assistance kiosks. So there had been a bid and call for proposals for places to serve, especially for populations that don't have internet access or a computer or an iPad or tablet, uh, to be able to fill out the census and to get assistance from someone and able to fill it out. And then finally, census inserts with various mailers, such as voter guides, heating centers, and utility bills. Finally, in terms of business engagement, uh, we've uh, had the opportunity to go to different chamber events um, to get people to sign pledge cards to educate their employees to serve as a census center or provide a kiosk, to sit at a business roundtable, or to be a census champion. I would encourage this for all of you to consider within your own agencies if it's not already happening. Um, to send either an, uh, to send an email to all of the employees. One of the ways I talk about this is think of it as like open enrollment period. People wait until the last week, sometimes until the last day to get it done, but those reminders do help. 
Um, we are looking at partnerships with entities like the Inland Empire Health Plan to be able to reach out to their client base. And this is something that all businesses and all government agencies should think about. We are entering that very important critical period um, in the next two to three months where people will need to be reminded, not just once, they'll need to be reminded a few times uh, to, be, to fill out that census. Because again, remember, each of those people represents $2,000 a year projected over 10 years, $20,000. That's all I have with my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the committee? I actually have one. Yeah. Uh, from the time the census is taken, what's the time frame from then to where uh, the data is public accessible? So the data will be available about a year after that, the first set of data that will be available is it's called the SF1 file, the summary uh, file one, which is used for redistricting, right? So that'll be the first tranche of data that goes out uh. um, with information on individuals based on their location of residence and, and, and some of those key demographic factors. And what constitutes um, hard to count areas? So hard to count. So based on the prior experience, um, there are different populations that, 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 that tend to be at a higher risk. So um, those age zero to five, this is why First Five, San Bernardino and Riverside are important partners. Um, young, what they call the young mobile population, people who are couch surfing right now, they are hard to count. Uh, people with disabilities, homeless population. There's a particular effort underway to identify essentially people that are that can be connected to shelters, right, um, and other uh, kind of institutional populations to be able to identify those. Um, it, in Riverside County, one of the areas with the highest hard to count uh, last time around was the census tract involving you know um, next to UC Riverside. So student populations, because of that, you know, that uncertainty about where they should be counted uh, creates uh, some issues as well. Um, immigrants, um, you know, regardless of their status, because of the uh, skepticism, especially with the federal government, poses issues as well. One thing I should note, and this is important, um, there, were, there was some anxiety about a citizenship question being included. As you saw in that form, it is not there. That should reassure populations. It should also reassure populations that none of this information will be shared with any other government agency, federal, state, or local. Code enforcement is not going to come after you based on that information. The IS is not going to come after you based on that information. And certainly ICE is not going to come after you based on that information. Well, thank you very much. If no one else has any questions, we want to thank you for the presentation and update. Thank you. Okay, next item 6D. Presentation by W.R. Cobb's, WR Cog's Public Service Fellows, Kristen Sosita, who is completing her fellowship in the city of Calamesa, and Esse? Esau Casimero. Esse? Mm -hmm. Casimero, who is completing his fellowship in County Riverside Executive Office, being introduced by Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just here to provide a quick introduction to the Public Service Fellow presentations. As many of you know, our fellowship program launched in 2016 with two major goals in mind. The first, to retain local talent emerging from universities in the region, and the second, to create a pipeline between those universities and local public sector careers. So today, I'm very excited to introduce two of our current Round 4 Fellows. Um, as a side note, all of our current Round 4 Fellows have been invited to present to one of WR COG's committees. And so today we have two to share a little bit about what they've worked on in their fellowship program. So first, I will turn it over to Kristen. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Salceda, and I'm a current WR COG Fellow for the city of Calamesa. Um, I'm very excited to stand here before you and share a little bit about my experience. Um, as you know, Calamesa is a very tight-knit, small community, and so as a fellow, I've actually had the opportunity to wear many different hats, working with code enforcement, building and safety, fire, planning. Um, just I got to have an overall well-rounded perspective of what a local government does. 
So just to begin, I wanted to share a little bit about a feature project that I've taken on um, at the city of Calamesa. And so I'm very interested in public transportation and making sure it's accessible and affordable to all people. Um, but another specific specialty of mine is I'm really passionate about um, senior citizens in regards to public transportation. Um, and so as you can see at this graph, um, Calamesa has an aging population that's increased from 2000 to 2018. Um, and so since our city hall is so close to our senior center, I thought it'd be really a great idea to just distribute a survey and see what are the senior populations and their needs in Calamesa. And so a little bit about just some quick survey results. Um, uh, just because I took the survey in the city of Calamesa Senior Center, I was aware that I'll, many, many of them would probably have access to um, transportation at that time. Um, so as you can see, 90% uh, had um, access to a vehicle. But something that I was really actually trying to capitalize on was their ability to use ride shares or if that was something that the senior citizen population was using. And so um, going off of some data based on like the Skag region and how Monrovia has partnered with Lyft and Uber to kind of subsidize transportation rides, I thought it'd be an interesting um, thing to look at. And so as you can see, 92.5% um, of the seniors that I surveyed actually was aware of what Uber and Lyft was, um, but only um, about 30 said so they were likely to use it in the future, um, about 50 cents saying unlikely. And so I just kind of wanted to see why. And so one of those um, barriers, I think, was technology. After surveying them, only about 42% owned a smartphone with applications. Um, and so just going ahead of future city initiatives, knowing what, what our population of senior citizens might need or we want in the future um, was a really great experience for me to have. Um, and just looking forward, I'm about to graduate from the University of Redlands with a dual degree in public policy and political science. So I'm really excited to basically join the public sector in the Southern California, uh, looking just for full-time employment in the public sector. Um, and so thank you for letting me share in front of all of you, since you are the policy makers of the Inland Empire. One day I hope to be in your shoes. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'd like to introduce our another co-fellow of ours. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Executive Committee. Uh, I'm Saul Casimiro. Uh, I'm also a fellow here at the uh, Public Service Fellowship with Dolgar Cog, and I also happen to work with Dr. Arma Christian at uh, UCR Center for Social Innovation as well. Uh, just a little background about me. Uh, I'm currently a second year Master of Public Policy student at uh, UCR where I study uh, race and immigration policy. Um, I'm currently placed at the uh, County Executive Office under the uh, guidance of uh, Deputy Executive Officer for Homeland Solutions, uh, Natalie Camaro. Uh, during my time at the Executive Office, uh, I worked under various projects that include, but are not limited to, uh, homeless encampment responses, uh, encampment protocols, and other reports pertaining to homeless issues. Uh, uh, the main project that I'm working on, it's uh, we're doing a survey for uh, to map the services available for homelessness, homelessness uh, here on the Canada Riverside. Uh, we're mainly using um, S3 Survey 123 app, and we're also using the uh, the mapping component RGIS. Um, this is pretty important because based on the 2019 point in time count, we had a total of uh, 2,881 uh, homeless individuals here in the county. Um, unfortunately. Um, this is a prelim preliminary map of the um, survey that we sent out to some of the agencies here in the county. We've had a, little, a very low uh, response rate, and we hope that uh, by the end of the, uh, the end of the fellowship, we have a more uh, accurate count. Uh, these are some of the agencies, and unfortunately, I cannot uh, put the name of the agency uh, for confidentiality, confidentiality issues. Uh, but hopefully. By the end of the fellowship, like, like I mentioned, we're going to have a fuller map where it shows that um, what services are available in the county, and this was, this is going to help us for planning purposes and to develop another um, other critical um, needed programs uh, for the for this population. Um, like, I, like I mentioned before, uh, for the rest of the uh, fellowship, I hope to complete uh, this project. Um, I feel like. This is something that we should all be paying attention to, this issue. Um, and just after the program ends, uh, apply to additional fellowships and hopefully uh, start my application process for a PhD program in uh, political science or uh, geography, which I've been really interested in the last few months because of the spatial analysis that um, capabilities that I, that I can do in that. Um, so thank you for your time. 
And uh, sorry that it was kind of brief. I'm a little bit of pain. Um, <laughs> but thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Any questions for our fellows? Okay, Norco. So that's not that's not um, not hazard pay, is it? I mean, hazard. <laughs> <laughs> Just a really kind suggestion that whenever you have a map, you left off three major cities: Europa Valley, and I'm sure we all noticed <laughs> Europa Valley, Eastvale, and Norco. And as you know, Norco <laughs> is the center of the universe. <laughs> What? <laughs> but my point is, is that we're very actively engaged, all three communities. I mean, Europa Valley is 45 square miles. Eastvale is 65,000 people. We're 27,000. We're very actively engaged in the homeless situation. So in the future, just a very kind suggestion, please include my city. I don't care so much about the other two. <laughs> Just a suggestion. Uh, right. It's just, it, it's just a map of some of the... I get it. I get it. <laughs> we have a question from Murrieta. For the young lady, yeah. your study on the senior citizens and the Uber app, and they were 50%, so they don't use it because they just don't have the app. So I was one of those. Mm -hmm. I don't consider myself all the way senior yet. <laughs> until, until one of my daughters loaded it onto my phone and said, there it is, Dad. You got to use it. Once I had that done, I use it all the time. So maybe some of our, one of our senior programs can be helping them load it on the app and learning, having them learn how to use it, and that will reduce that 50%. Do you think that would make a huge impact on that 50% that don't use it? Yeah, I've actually done some, this is part of my uh, honors project at school mm -hmm. actually, and seeing um, one of the biggest things was just informing them how to use the app. Um, and I think another roadblock is actually because they don't have smartphones, giving them a smartphone if they don't want it is a little bit harder. But there's apps such as GoGo Grandparent, which is a funny name, but it, it allows them to just call, like have a, um, right. an audio call and maybe um, I have a payment on a computer or system something later. And so if they don't necessarily want to have a smartphone, they don't need to use the service without it. So yeah, I just think education would be probably one of the top. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We have Western in the queue. You, you broke it. I didn't touch anything yet. I didn't do anything. Every time I turn my mic on. I think it's Kelly trying to sabotage me. Wow. Wow. Brenda, would you like to ask your question? Yes, if I'm not going to get squelched okay. on anymore. So in relationship to... <laughs> My God, I think it's Chuck doing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is about the pit count. Uh, I was actually a participant this year for the pit count. When are the numbers going to be released for this year's count in comparison to last year's numbers? Do you have any idea? I'm not entirely sure, but I believe they come out sometime late April. Late April, okay. Yes. And have you thought that perhaps, I don't know what your response has been to your survey. You said it was it's relatively low. So, yeah. So, Maybe perhaps you have a conversation with RCTC as how they're getting their survey put out there and people are commenting on that because it sounds like they've gotten a huge response to their survey questionnaire on the whole traffic plan and relief thing. So that might be something to do. But um, the other thing, too, that I wanted to make a comment on is, is that it, it was interesting on the deployment for the pit count that the numbers seem to be a little bit lower because of two things. One, the number of hours that were actually deployed in the deployment plan. So it was very early morning hours, so it's very difficult to track these guys down, especially if they're doing couch surfing because they're not coming out until later in the afternoon. So it's a little bit harder to locate those individuals um, because the deputies that we went out with as our part of our escort team that are involved with these, it looks like we missed probably 50 to 75% on the count. So just just a little feedback on that to take forward, but love to see how the numbers changed and if there was a, a big jump or if it stayed relatively flat and when that could come back to 
this body because it, it is funding dollars for us. It's funding dollars for the county and funding dollars for programs and, and it tackles a problem that most of you face in the cities and it's been an outlying problem for a long time. So thank you very much though, appreciate your work. Great, uh, as for the times for the pay count, <laughs> that will be under uh, DPSS. They're the ones that set the, uh, the times. So we don't exactly have control over that uh, time period. I was also part of this, this year's uh, volunteers and I also saw the same thing that you saw. Yeah. So maybe have a conversation with DPSS about that. Well, that might be, that might be a great question to put on your survey too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next item, item seven, report from attack chair, Chris Lopez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a couple items for me. Uh, we welcomed a couple new city managers at our last meeting, uh, Jacob Ellis from the city of Corona, as well as uh, Rod Butler from the city of Harupa Valley. So we made sure to welcome them to the TAC. And then finally, our next meeting is March 19th uh, at 9 o'clock. So we will see the city managers then. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Item eight, report from committee representatives. Are there any SCAG regional council or policy committee rep representatives who would like to share a report or provide a report? Uh, ben isn't here. Brian, do you have anything from CalCalc? Okay. Rusty, anything? Okay. And Crystal from San Diego? Yep, I might as well uh, let you know. <laughs> we had a very interesting meeting. I did figure out my Spanish has gotten really rusty because half the meeting was in Spanish. Um, so we were talking about the issues with the um, border um, they, and the um, new uh, crossing um, uh, facilities that they're implementing and how we can help. Also, I think I mentioned the last time that apparently we're having a really bad issue with the pollution all along the coastline. And so um, they were refreshing that and, and going over that again. But it was a really interesting conversation. I'm trying to bring all of us in, including those in Riverside County, on, on how do we handle um, the back and forth going from, from there to here, or even they wanted to talk about how going from um, like Riverside County down to San Diego. So it's it's all of the borders right now, but the the interesting part was was how many um, legislators were there. I mean, there there was so much room, we were like double this size. Um, and um, watching the um, uh, issues that they have, it's the same issues that we have, which is really interesting. It's the same issues that we have um, with homelessness. We talk about the homelessness. We talk about all these different things, and it's it's really it, it transverses and goes, you know, intercontinental as well. And and so it's something that we all need to keep an eye on. And it's interesting to to watch them. Not a lot about you know what we could do to help, but but it was an interesting update. Thank you, Europa uh, Valley. Can you hear me? Okay. A uh, report from the Community Economic and Human Development uh, Committee. Uh, just a reminder, if any members here, uh, WR COG, have any policy issues you want submitted for determination uh, by the General Assembly, yeah, it should be uh, presented in the uh, form of a proposed resolution or any proposed revisions to the SCAG bylaws. Uh, those resolutions will be submitted uh, to SCAG uh, Resolutions Committee and then uh, to the Regional Council at the General Assembly, which is May 7th, 2020 at 9 a.m. And that will be at uh, JW Marriott in uh, Palm Desert. Hmm. Agenda item number three, which was the state HCD review findings of SCAG's draft RENA methodology, which has been an issue, uh, I think, for all of us. <clears throat> letters received by SCAG uh, for the draft RENA methodology uh, was Gateway Cities, Huntington Beach, uh, Holly Osborne, don't know who she is, but Tustin, F Fountain Valley, Cerritos, Karen Farley, Steve Sowell, Janet Chang, and Downey. Those, are, those letters are available if you want to see them. State Housing and Community Development, or the HCD department, issued its uh, review findings on SCAG's sixth cycle draft housing needs or the RENA uh, methodology and the findings were SCAG's draft methodology furthers the five statutory uh, objectives described in the uh, state law which is increased 
increasing the housing supply, promoting infill development and socioeconomic equity, promoting an improved interregional